they wanted me to take them through my journey from being an O-line coach to being a head coach in the National Football League. So I had to go back and look at all the different things. And it came out um, that really the people that I met, the coaches that I met throughout and the different people that I met throughout were so important to elevating you to the next level along with the quarterbacks. Welcome to Beyond the Game. It is my great privilege and honor to invite, he's not that old, I'm older than him, but an old friend, Andy Reid, on our set. Andy, thank you for being with us. Absolutely, Mike. Appreciate you having me. <laughs> well, it's kind of you to come on. I know that, uh, I think today you started um, with some of your team out in Kansas City. Yeah, we've been uh, in our off-season program, and we practice today, and uh, we just just got a lot of meetings right now. So it was good to jump on with you. You know, I'm I'm just amazed. You know, but you've been a legend. I was it 1947 when you won that punt, pass, and kick competition. <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. No, a no, long time ago. but. You know, tell us a little bit. I that is a famous video, but I think a lot of people misunderstand it, and it's so cute. But uh, tell us a little bit about that punt, pass, and kick that Andy Reid broke the barriers yeah. in the football in the football uh, community. Yeah, so I I have to explain this to the players because they give me a bad time about this. But uh, the kid that's in front of me is eight years old, or actually he's behind me. He's eight years old. And you, you're in a line. I was 13. He was eight. So I was, that's 13 was as old as you could do. Like, so I was in the back of the line. <clears throat> but by the time I got up to throw the ball there and uh, the eight year old now had gone, you know, to the back of the line and worked his way up and he was right behind me. But it looks like I'm going against him. There were two lines though. So there are two lines of eight through 13 year olds. And uh, anyways, it looks well, like Andy, I'm going against uh, an eight-year-old there. But. Yeah, <laughs> but you've yeah. always been a man among boys, and and I so appreciate just that <laughs> fun that we've had seeing that, and then watching your successes ever since our days at BYU. Do you have a moment that you can tell us how you got to BYU? Yeah, so I grew up in Los Angeles, and I went to junior college, and. I hurt. I got hurt. Uh, we went to a bowl game. I tore up my knee pretty good. And uh, BYU, I was scheduled to go to Stanford. I ended up going to, uh, they they pulled out after the injury and BYU hung in there. And uh, Was Bill Walsh or George Seifert the coach at Stanford then? Actually, Bill, Bill had just left. Okay. So, yeah, he was just leaving for the Niners there. So, um, but it was... Uh, Listen, it was a towards the end of recruiting there, and I I took a trip to BYU along with one of my teammates, Randy Tidwell, and we both decided to come. I remember Randy Tidwell. Yeah. So wow. So you decided to come, and what year was that? What was your your first year at BYU? You had been at what junior college? Glendale Junior College in California. Okay. okay. And and uh, that would have been. 77 late 77 okay yeah so and so was 78 maybe, maybe it was 78 right in that area 77 78 because i redshirted that year because i had knee surgery so well remember i mean we had a big redshirt class in 1978 guys like you glenn titanser danny frazier i was redshirted was that yeah, yeah that was the same year yeah. And Wally English was the offensive coordinator. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the year. Yeah. So I, the ended, next... up getting, I ended up getting close with with uh, Coach English there when uh, when I became a coach. So he, 
I saw a different side of him from I'm, a no, I'm sure standpoint. Yeah, but wow, Rand. I mean, it was um, it was what what great years and the contrast from '78 to '79. I mean, remember '78 was when Mark Wilson and Jim McMahon were trading time. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, that was that was a fun uh, that was a fun year for that one. <laughs> Well, you said that Mike Holmgren was one of your mentors, you know, when you went into the coaching profession. Were you there at BYU when Mike was the offensive coordinator? Yeah, so after I got done playing, I stayed on and finished up my master's and uh, um, and coached the junior varsity program. And they had brought Mike Holmgren in as the quarterback coach there. And so I had a chance to meet him, and I remember <laughs> – I remember him saying to me, someday if I'm a head coach, you're the first guy I'm calling. And I go, yeah, right. You know, I sure, love that. Sure. For sure. Yeah. For sure. I have. And you know what? He held to his word. So he, he called me when he became the head coach of the Green Bay Packers. And I was at the university of Missouri at that time. And, and, um, he offered me a job. So well, let me share something about Mike. Because my uh, my senior year, 1981, would have been my senior year, I blew out my knee. But it was during the fall camp. So I had been in, in the meetings, and I was all excited. I was on offense. Jim McMahon had asked for me to be a tight end. And right. it was fun to go back from defense <laughs> to offense. Yep. So anyway, we were... We were in one of our offensive meetings, and I swear it was Mike Holmgren. It could have been Ted Tolner, but it was Mike Holmgren. He says, I went through all your plays last year, and you guys were throwing it 60 or 70% of the time and running it the rest. I grew up handing it to O.J. Simpson at USC, and we're going to flip-flop. We're going we're gonna to be a 60% run and 40% pass team. This coming year. And I remember Jim McMahon and some of the other quarterbacks rolling their eyes. Do you remember how that season ended? Yeah, we we uh, threw the ball a lot. <laughs> we threw the ball even more than the prior year. Yeah, yeah that was. Yeah. And so it, it was cool to me to see this metamorphosis of Mike Holmgren. And, and what a great coach he has been, was, and and probably still is. Um, tell me, tell me about how he impacted you in your coaching career. Yeah. So I, uh, listen, I mean, I'll preface it with this. Um, he should be a hall of famer. He, he was, uh, you've got Brett Favre in the hall of fame and you got Ron Wolf for general manager in the hall of fame. And it's only right that, that, uh, Mike would be in the hall of fame. So I, I would tell you, you know, I, when I worked for him, I, I didn't think anybody did it better than he did. And now that I've been a head coach for a few years, I, I feel the same way. I just, uh, I think he was just tremendous and how he handled everything. So if, as far as being a mentor, I talk to him often and, um, you know, he's always got good advice and uh, I appreciate his input uh, when I do have a chance to talk to him. Well, Andy, you have <laughs> developed your own reputation as uh, let's call it an offensive savant. Is that fair? <laughs> Not sure. asking. I know you're a humble guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I know. Uh, but, that's, but, a, no, you, that's a heavy title, but yeah, I, I hear you. But, yeah. you know, we played for guys like Doug Scoville and Mike Holmgren, Wally English, and they, they uh, what I was so impressed with Doug Scoville was uh, his ability to set up a play, you know, that, he would set up a strong safety or a weak safety or a cornerback or a, a linebacker by seeing the same set and the same trunk of each each um, pass pattern. And then all of a sudden, like 10 plays later, it would look the same as that play you've seen a couple of times before and then totally different. And And he'd set that player up. So to me, it was like a chess match where you were setting something up plays and plays and plays ahead. Sure. And then the other side of the coin is the L.A. Raiders kind of style where you're drawing up plays on the sideline. And sometimes when I see you talking to Patrick Mahomes, 
it looks to me like you're drawing up some plays that might work. I don't know. Tell me, tell me your opinion on setting up future plays versus being serendipitous. Yeah, I think that's important when you're when you're calling plays that you try to stay in advance um, and and be able to give the defense different different looks, but really the same look. So out of the same formations and motions and shifts, that ends up being important. Um, and, and to be able to do that, you've got to stay stay ahead of the game. And you're kind of thinking three, four plays ahead and where you're going to go with it and what field position you're in and the hash marks and what's best with the matchups outside and so on. So um, that that's, uh, you know, that's where you go. But w- listen, we were, we were both lucky to play at BYU. And Amen. we saw how the pass game works. I mean, really works. And from the from the beginning when nobody else was doing it. And so we had this confidence in it um, but to, to throw the football and we weren't afraid to try different things because we saw our coaches doing all these different things at a time that it wasn't real popular. And so I've been able to just kind of carry that into the National Football League with me. And even though I was an offensive lineman, I, um, you know, Mike Holmgren made me get out of that box and, uh, and see it from the quarterback standpoint and, uh, but you still maintain that that mentality that you're not afraid to try new things and uh, the whole field belongs to you. Let you use it and let's see how we can use it the best against whatever coverage uh, these these guys, these creative defensive coordinators are going to show us, you know. What? So. Keep up that powerful process that you've got going. That is so fun. And to me, you're continuing and even expanding on the legends that – that you and I played for that we enjoyed so much. Yeah, it's been, it was great, great experience for sure. Back at your your first first uh, efforts at Brigham Young University, you came in not as a member of the church, I believe. Is that right? right? That's right. right. So, so tell me, tell me, you know, did you make any new friends? What what were some of the things that you did when you first came to BYU? You felt or uh, or experienced. Yeah, listen, I I was uh, into athletics. I mean, that's really what I what I was in in school, and so BYU didn't have all the temptations. I mean, I saw a lot of things growing up in Los Angeles, and um, as you did in California, it's uh, it, you know, there's it's just a little different uh, different experience. And I grew up around all different kinds of people, all different religions, all different uh, races, and and um, uh, right below Dodger Stadium area there, so it was a it was a great education on one side, but um, it also allowed me to hone in and stay away from the trouble by honing in on on sports. And I had great high school coaches, junior high school coaches, little league coaches, and um, and so when I came to BYU, I go, this is great. You don't have all these huge temptations. You're you're it's pretty much narrowed down and. Uh, um, you know, into school and, and sports and uh, dating. I was lucky to meet my wife there who kept me on the straight and narrow. That's and, where you met Tammy. Yeah. 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 So, um, and she grew up as a member of the church. And um, and so, l- listen, I mean, it changed changed my life. I had a bunch of great examples like yourself and uh, that, that had fun uh, other ways than having to go out and drink or do drugs or all that stuff you know we we just we had a blast doing what we did and um you know it was just it was a great a lot of great examples there glenn Titzer was a great example you mentioned him earlier and uh you know randy tidwell and so on so just a ton of great examples there what school did you go to in in high school and i went to john john marshall John Marshall, what town is that in? It's, uh, it's in Los Angeles. It's right below Dodger Stadium area. Really? Yeah. I was born in Inglewood. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I knew Inglewood, and yeah. uh, but raised in in Cordova, outside Sacramento, and so sure, totally identify with what you say. It was able. We were able to concentrate. I too, uh, I turned down a Stanford scholarship. My coach thought I was crazy to go to BYU. And, uh, but I will never, never regret it. Yeah. And meeting, (laughs) I mean, when we went to Lavelle's funeral and connected with 
all our mutual friends and then the guys yeah, that were before and after us. What a what a privilege to be in that group, right? Wow, that was phenomenal. Uh, he was a phenomenal guy. I mean, until till really, until he passed, he, uh, <clears throat> he would check in on me once a week and just see how things were going. And what a great example, what a great example that is for, you know, for a young coach to be able to teach the guys that have been around him uh, that loyalty and dedication. I mean, he was, he was great about that. And I got to spend, um, <clears throat> my voice is going out. I mean, <laughs> have you been yelling on. at NFL players? Well, we've got, we're blooming here too. So oh. it's probably a little bit of allergies on top of that, but <clears throat> um you know, he uh, he would spend a, a week or two down in Capistrano Beach um, every summer, and I've got a place there, and so I'd be able to spend a week with him and take him out to lunch, and we we talk a lot, and it was it was a great it was great fun for me. He he know? had some instructive comments for me. I went golfing once with him on a trip to Scotland and Ireland. How about that? And, oh, it was unbelievable, Andy. You were probably and, too busy coaching to go back then. But yeah. anyway, I was up on above a green. I'd, I'd pulled it on the prior shot. And so I was parallel with the hole. And then I'm chipping on. Um, Lavelle was like 45 degrees on the green already, of course. And I'm chipping. But for some reason, I either hosled it or, or towed it. And my ball did a lazy line drive right at coach Edwards and, and Lavelle said, Mike, I didn't know I was in your direct line of fire. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, He's the best. I love coach Edwards. And to me, you follow in his footsteps more than any of the other coaches I've seen and that, that have followed him. You, the way you handled that, that Butker situation in your locker room was admirable thank you for standing up for what we stand for in our country sure no he's he's a good kid real good kid so you know it, i didn't say a real good public speaker i said a real good kid <laughs> well and you know think about it i mean an nfl team even though these guys are all making a whole bunch every year right they're they're more like a microcosm of our country they're exactly from all different parts of the country. They have different political beliefs, different social and cultural beliefs. And in that locker room, how do you keep that locker room so, I mean, melded and unified? Yeah. Um, I, well, first of all, the guys are the, these guys are givers, and they they understand the culture that we have here, and they bought into it, and uh, and that that's important. I mean, that's a that's an maybe the most important factor is that the, you bring somebody in here and they're going to befriend them and help teach them. And they'll tell them what's right and what's wrong according to uh, the principles that we, we've established here. And uh, and it's not that everybody always does the right thing, but they don't get too far off. And when they, when they do, players, uh, you know, our locker room will reel the guys back in and um, uh, that, that's and well, I've got some great leadership there. So uh, Bucker being one of them, he's on our players committee and he's he's very strong in his faith and uh, believes in it, lives it. Most of all, he lives it. A lot of people talk about things and talk about faith, but they <laughs> once they get done talking, they don't go live it. And so that's that's why everybody respects him so much. And we didn't have a lot of commotion going on in the locker room, as far as guys that might not uh, believe in all of the things that he said, but they end up supporting him uh, because they know where his heart's at. And that, that ends up uh, being an important uh, and and its own self, uh, you know, very important uh, quality to have within your locker room. And, you know, uh, we, it is a microcosm of life, and we're sitting here uh, at a time that people have opinions, but don't necessarily respect the people that are saying whatever their opinion is, and then they downgrade them as human beings. And um, that's not how we roll. We you, you go ahead and try to learn, if if interested, um, and then 
you move on, but don't don't throw them in the bad person category because they think different than you do. Just, uh, uh, you know, you can take a minute to think about it. And then, and, and if you choose to ask questions, you can ask the person questions. But then, again, again, if you don't agree with it, you don't agree with it. Let's not start a war over it. A verbal war in, in our case here. What a beautiful thing. And and truly, that's how our country has has been raised. That's how we come to accommodate each other and our regions and and our different beliefs. And thank you for representing that in your locker room and with your team. Um, that's admirable. And I, I'm going to be the first one to say it. Probably others in Kansas City have. I nominate Andy Reid for president <laughs> of the United yeah. States of America. We need <laughs> we need more of that unity. And and even yeah. even though I say that in jest, we do now have the masher on board. Oh, Kate. Steve. I like the little goatee that you got going there, my yeah. man. My wife says I'm too bald, so if I have a little facial hair, it looks a little better. So I just do what I'm told. I understand completely. <laughs> Were, were you that way when you were at BYU doing what you were told? Uh, no. Uh, that's oh. what got me in trouble a little bit. That's why I probably ended up meshing with, with Andy so well uh, in <laughs> that circumstance. Well, that's that's not, not what I heard. I heard that he was dragging you into study hall. Well, the story is, is I got into some academic trouble. Uh, I hate to say that now that I'm in my 23rd year as a public school superintendent and 42nd year in public education. But I did end up having to take some block classes. And that's right when Andy Reid came in from the JC. I don't know if it was the end of April-ish, right before spring ball. Does that sound right? Hey, no, that would have been it. Andy and I were in some of the same classes because he came in as a block. I was there. And I, I, um, I remember, I think we were in a zoology class. And we were, you know, because athletes kind of mesh together we end up sit together and we were in this time when we were looking at some pretty tough stuff and Andy said to me I was I don't think I was masher yet then I don't think that had happened I think I was just who, who, who by the way named you the masher well was that Doug Scoble Doug or Scoble. Who? Uh, okay he, he actually in a practice one day I just went out we were seven on seven I was running a route and one of you linebackers kind of went to to stop me and I think just lean back a little bit. I just have to hit him just right. Put him on. Must his have back. been. Must have been Ed St. Pierre. Must have yeah, been. I, I think it was Ed. I do. I was one of Andy's old roommates. But anyway, <laughs> he fell on his butt, and uh, I came back and Doug Scoble said, "Masher, you mashed that kid. You just mashed him down. We're gonna have to call you Masher." And then I think somebody like Scott Phillips wrote it on my locker, Masher. And then after that, there are guys at BYU that didn't know my name. They just thought I was Masher. So. That, yep. That's what's on your door in the well, administrative building. Well, it's I, I shouldn't tell you this. It's one of my passwords I use with other things. So I've used that for 40 years now. Anyway, we're in that class, and Andy said something that was so unique to me that it, it sticks with me 40, 50 years later. He goes, hey, Steve, do you want to go study tonight? And I Because there was a test tomorrow. And I go, wow, that's a unique thought. Study? And so I think we went and studied, and my academic career turned around, and I turned into a public educator because of the great NFL football coach, Andy Reid. So thanks, Andy, for getting me turned around academically. And I don't even know if you knew that. Uh, I think you've said it before. But that, I'll t listen, I appreciate the the kudos, man. That I got. Uh, cool. how, about, how about the other part of the masher is that he's from Idaho and they're potatoes. I mean, they yeah. got to have that. You got to have that part in there. So I don't I'm think that. Tie, come on. He, there. he wanted tie. it to be for knocking over linebackers. Yeah, come on. Not to take... well, he did that too. He did that too. <laughs> hey, if you're going to take stabs at me, I'll I'll, I'll throw out another stab, Andy. Did you want me to do that? You the one where I had a holding call on your touchdown? Yes. <laughs> at Wisconsin, Jim McMahon throws a touchdown pass to me. I was on the goal line. We had double tie with the wing. I was the wing. And everybody – on KSL, Paul James here, Steve Carlson, touchdown. And then, of course, holding number 64, BYU. It's an all, I'm out of the record books for, you know, pass receptions for Jim McMahon. The, I did have a few touchdowns, but they were all rushing. So, anyway, I still love you, Andy. <laughs> no. uh, can you imagine the offensive linemen talking about the fullbacks 
who missed the hole. No, no kid. That he never missed a hole. No. Yeah. No. See that? That's well, Andy. I got it. I, I never had enough chances, so I had to make sure I made good on every one of them. So. <laughs> You know, it's funny you bring that up at the end of the season, talking about the stats that Jim McMahon would have had a pass, a touchdown pass to you. Um, when I caught that ball against Texas A&M in 1979, you know, that was a that was the biggest thing that had happened in my life as far as sports were concerned to that point. Of course, Danny Frazier broke his neck, you know, that same game. And so weeks later, Coach Edwards asked me to switch back to linebacker. So I did. And at the end of the season, the Salt Lake Tribune had a recap of our wonderful season. And it said that Eric Lane caught the two point conversion against Texas A&M. I said, I'm already written out of the history books. And it wasn't Andy Reid. Yeah, that, that ripped the wrote you out. Yeah. Andy, uh, what do you remember about the masher be, besides gravy and, and mashed potatoes? <laughs> He was big and smooth and a good athlete, all the way around, good athlete. Wow. I, Mount, Mount Pilliard, man, the pride of Mount Pilliard. Mount Pilliard, he remembers, he remembers my Bear Lake uh, high school days, so cool. No, I remember the deer hunts, too, up there. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the stories. Is I mean, that what you guys did, or you, he just told you the no, stories? No, he told me I lived it vicariously. You know? Yeah, I lived, it's funny, I was from small town, Idaho, he's L.A., and we end up becoming friends, and it's just the nature of a BYU type thing that it, a guy with the mom, mom's a physician, your dad, I think, cartoonist at Walt Disney, correct? Yeah, he's an artist, yeah. Artist he, that's and, where he started off, but he. Yeah, and yeah. here we, we end up being friends, and, and um, you know, we continued on and off, and we're both too busy. We don't get to see each other nearly enough, but I do send him a text once in a while, and he jabs me back. Well, hey, Steve. He did. Now, I'm just I'm going to make this public to the universe now that he accommodated this circumstance that we're on right now, that maybe we would be able to have that dinner with him and our spouses, you know, in California yeah. at one of his vacations, hopefully this year. One of my vacations. Yeah. One of, uh, yeah. One of your 12, one of your 12 hours. One of your 12 hour vacations that you yeah. have in your 365 day a year job. And we'll have to rendezvous there. That'd yeah. be cool. That'd be that would be cool. Andy, tell us, tell us what maybe one of the most difficult things about being a coach is because when I look at the process and Tom Holmo was talking about when you were at San Francisco state, you had to, you know, I mean, you didn't have to, but you were out helping sell hot dogs so that the players had food during spring ball. Um, there had to be a lot of difficult times working your way up through the ranks and coaching. Yeah, um, but they were all good uh, you, you, because you didn't know any better when you were at that particular spot. Um, uh, at San Francisco State, you taught classes. You were, you were, I was raising a young family, and um, and we were trying to make money for not only to live, but also uh, for the football team. Uh, by selling the hot dogs. So every Tuesday and Thursday, we'd sell the hot dogs. Every day at noon, <clears throat> there would be a siren that went off, and it was a, uh, it was a, um, that all the students would fall on the ground. You know, they would uh, for the nuclear, you know, to protest the nuclear arms. And so, um, and then they'd stand back up, buy a hot dog, and walk away. And I go, this is this is unbelievable. You know, <laughs> huh? so. Uh, there were experiences like that all the way through and met a lot of great people. I had a chance to talk to the offensive line coaches of the national football league and they have a, they have a group they call the mushroom club. So, um, they, they get together once a year and they, I, they asked me to speak. So I spoke and I, I went through, I, I never looked back, but I went through and I had to, they wanted to, me to take him through my journey from being an O-line coach to being a head coach in the National Football League. So I had to go back and look at all the different things. And it came out um, that really the people that I met, the coaches that I met throughout and the different people that I met throughout were so important to elevating you to the next level along with the quarterbacks. Every, every stop, we had a quarterback that was a productive quarterback 
um, if not an All-American, he was uh, an All-Conference player and then an All-Pro player once I got in the National Football League. And I'm still I'm still riding on the coattails of these quarterbacks uh, today. So, and the great people that I've met throughout my staff uh, are guys that I've known for a long time and uh, have had a chance to work with, and they're great people. So I'm very fortunate that way. What is it about you linemen? I think of Lavelle Edwards, who also was a lineman. How do you guys become these leaders of of men in in something that more, more approximate approximates war and the difficulties of war? I mean, professional football particularly, you have to be a strong leader and a good leader to uh, to do that. Why is it the offensive or defensive linemen that quite often gravitate to these positions? Yeah, I think you know we're. I don't think offensive linemen get a whole lot of credit, nor want the credit. So when you, you you kind of take a humble approach to things and and you move forward and you don't expect a bunch of pats on the back um, uh, in doing your job, you just you and you're normally the guys are pretty honest because they're you're a grunt on a football team. You're the one doing all the dirty work. You're not born in a three point stance, you know, and and then you're going backwards half of the time trying to block somebody. So um, it's, it's one of those, it's just the mentality, I think of, of the beast there. So, uh, and it stays consistent. It stays consistent. I think at the high school level, I think it stays consistent at college and in the national football league and needless to say, Masher, they're also the smartest guys. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, see, we, we teed that one up pretty well, right, Steve? Yeah. Yep. Can I inject something there? Uh, Please. I remember playing a football game. And we played most of our games at home at one o'clock at Lavelle Edwards Stadium, which was Cougar Stadium at the time. But Andy, we'd usually, by the time we became good friends in my junior and senior year, both Andy's junior and senior year, we'd uh, probably do something, and then he'd say, "Hey, let's let's get back in time to watch the game again on KPYU." And I hate to admit it now, but I thought, "Well, my heck, Andy, we just played it. Why do we want to watch it?" Well, that's the difference between greatness and probably just averageness he loved football he, See, he should have been a quarterback yeah he should have been a quarterback you know, the few times we were on the field he was just waiting for us to be on the field and we'd watch it on the little 19 inch tvs or whatever we had and, and that that always stuck out to me when i've talked about andy the fact that he'd want to go watch the game again at seven o'clock or eight o'clock that night on kbyu so so have you ever not thought about kbyu for a few years andy yeah no you, you know <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, KBYU, I love it. Uh, that's true, too. I mean, I remember doing that. But that that's the fun part of it. Andy, I have a question for you. You know, I remember our offensive line coaches back in those days, and I don't remember if it was Dave Craig Thorpe or Mel Olson or Roger French who was your more disciplinarian offensive line coach. Who, who would have been the more disciplinarian one? <clears throat> I, I would probably say Dave Craigthorpe um, was was very disciplined. I had him for – I only was with uh, – as a player with Roger French for a year, my senior year. And um, and then the other couple of years I was with uh, Dave Craigthorpe. And he he was uh, he was a great football coach. I mean, a great football coach, and uh, but was very discipline-oriented. And then when – the creature came in. Um, <laughs> he was uh, he was a little bit more uh, let your personality show, footloose, fancy free, uh, but work the dog out of you. And and um, but he wanted you to he kind of wanted you to flow with the game that way, and uh, it wasn't quite as disciplined that way. All right. So my question for you on offensive linemen: what what are one or two, three keys? to being an effective offensive lineman, particularly in the, in the pass protection? Yeah. Um, One or two. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it always comes back to the feet and probably your core strength. And, and, and then, um, you know, the fight in you, I mean, how, how are you going to stay in there and battle? Uh, it's not always pretty. doesn't have to be pretty, uh, but you've got to, and, and you're sitting there, Michael, going, "Yeah, it's holding." Is really what it is, but, but you, you gotta, you gotta be able to, 
uh, when you're talking to defensive guys, Steve, man, it's, it's always a, holding. Yeah, no, it's always holding. So, um, but you've got to, you know, you've got to stay disciplined within that. You got to kind of dance the same dance as the, be able to dance the same dance as the guy next to you. So here's my bone. We all watched the, the Super Bowl and so excited about it. But here is Andy Reid, one of the top coaches in the country and uh, one of the best offensive linemen back then, taught to keep his feet, and a receiver knocked you off your base. Yeah. I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> Andy, what would Dave Cragthorpe say? Yeah, that wasn't real good. A tight end. Let's, let's go tight end. <laughs> Not a receiver. A big tight end. He's and just listen, a, listen, he's when, when just I a played, receiver. When I played, I weighed less than he played, than he does. Right really? Yeah, he's guard sixty pounds. Oh, he's a yeah. he's a beast. Yeah. And and Chad Lewis and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, and the way you handled that, I said Andy handled that really well, and Chad said no, he didn't handle it really well. He handled it perfectly, and you did. I mean, think about the egos, the just the. The competitive challenges out there. You're in the Super Bowl. You're in the biggest arena, and we athletes, he at at a at a stratospheric level above us, you know, wanted something, and he caught you off guard, and without your base. So Dave Craigthorpe yeah. might be upset. Yeah. Wow. But Andy, thank you for uh, for representing BYU and the human race in such a great way. You know, you know that. Uh... He, I'm very close with him. He, he's uh, the one player that's been here the whole time. I, I drafted him here, or was involved with the draft here. When with it, you know, from him coming from college to the NFL, and um, I drafted his brother also, and we, we've we've kind of grown together. To Philadelphia, <laughs> I mean, you drafted him to Philly. His brother, I drafted his brother in Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I've known that family, and I've known those kids for a long time, and. Um, and and he uh, he's a real emotional guy, but that's what makes him great. Yeah. And the son of a gun wants to play, and unfortunately, he's getting older. So I try to buy him downs by taking him out of the game. Well, that game, he didn't want to come out of the game. He didn't want any part of that. He was wired as wired as you can believe, and and that's why he came over. But he, you know, he caught me when I wasn't looking. At least he could have got me when I was looking. I could maybe give him a little. So you got you got blindsided. You got blindsided. Yeah, I got blindsided. Doc. <laughs> I love that, Steve. Do you have anything to add to that? No, just you know, it's just fun to be able to chat with you two guys, and and uh, you know, there's we've got so much history, and I don't know, Andy, just you know, being able to say, hey, I can get a hold of Andy once in a while and say, hey, it's it's just great thinking about the good old days and how much you did have an influence on me academically because we ended up having. A lot of classes. Andy, I believe, was a double major, and uh, one of his double majors was the same major as mine. So we had a lot of classes together the last couple of years, and and we had a lot of good times. And and we double dated a few times. We went out to, I don't know who was the golf pros that that Tammy used to babysit for. Yeah, Johnny Miller. Johnny Miller. We went out to Johnny Miller's house a few times and and uh, had dinner and while he was while she was babysitting. So thanks, Andy, and thanks, Mike, for doing this beyond the game and bringing back a lot of great memories hang on with me five more minutes that max will will be done right away andy um i had one more question for well a couple what was your master's degree in um it was in phys ed in, okay yeah sports management whatever i can't remember the title of it but it was yeah. I, I met some great people there uh dr elmo roundy was my uh advisor and uh, there were just you know, so many good, good people. Larry Hall, who was phenomenal. Masher and I think both had him for yep. motor learning. Yep. <clears throat> so we, you know, just there, there were some real good people there. Yeah. Well, football, we talked about, Chad Lewis was talking about you being maybe the most aggressive offensive coordinator in the NFL. My question, I remember watching our offense back in the day when maybe 60% of the balls were were passed to the offensive backs or to the tight ends, and the rest went to the wideouts. Now in the uh, 
you know, what do they call it? The um, spread offense. They're trying to pass it most of the time to the wideouts. Do you still implement more of that ball control pass offense and it looks aggressive because the ball's in the air? Or or have you got kind of a hybrid there? Yeah, so back when we played, there were two backs in the backfield normally. Um, now, you, you very seldom you have two backs in the backfield. And uh, you have that receiver out there, that extra receiver or an extra tight end out there. And you utilize them in the pass game, whether it's down the field or, <clears throat> or um, you know, your short intermediate game. So, and then in the run game, you do the same thing. So your, all your play action stuff where most of your deep balls come from, uh, th- those end up being out of those personnel groups, uh, the three wides or, or double tight stuff. So, um, but it's a mixture. It's a mixture. You've got to, you've got to layer the whole field somewhere, during a game and still be able to run the ball. So sometimes you're aggressive in your pass game and sometimes your ball control, I don't know, would you, would you consider it always aggressive or, or kind of a mixture? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's Sorry. Not always, it's, yeah. It's not always aggressive. I mean, there, there's a point, you know, there's a point that you, you got about, you have about 15 good plays in there. They're kind of rip your heart out plays that you just know are going to work and you can get after the defense pretty good. <clears throat> but you have to balance those out. You can't exhaust all those in the first quarter. True. Um, you, you've got to balance it out and know when to use them. And in between that, they're possession, more possession throws, whether it's short or intermediate depth, uh, that's what it is. But um, you've got to kind of – you've got to space those babies out, the, the deeper ones. We love what you're doing. Keep it up. All the way to a hundred, Andy. You uh, you're an inspiration to us. Thanks for carrying on traditions that that we saw. Do you have? I mean, right now this audience is primarily well, a lot of BYU people. Give us your parting thoughts on <clears throat> on your experience with BYU and what you see going on there now. Yeah, listen, I I love BYU. I. I bleed blue. I'm always supporting them uh, in whatever sport um, they're playing. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to have graduated from there. Uh, I think what <clears throat> uh, many many kids don't understand is if you get a degree from there, um, like the three of us, it's a instant ticket um, out there for the potential of getting a job. You're coming into a job saying, okay, this guy's a BYU grad. There's got to be some integrity within him and honesty and um, and work ethic and all of those things that, that kind of go with what the church stands for. That, that that introduces you into these jobs, and then it's important that you are that uh, yeah. as you go forward. But um, uh, that's they, they always say that you, you want to pick a school that means means something and that uh, can open doors for you. And BYU, I think, is one of the best at doing that. And then it's all of our responsibility to make sure that we uh, take care of business. Well, brother, you are taking care of business. There's an administrator up in northern Utah who's taking care of business. And I appreciate both of you good gentlemen joining us on Beyond the Game tonight. Thanks right. a lot. Appreciate you. Thank Look you, gentlemen. Look how relaxed the master is. Look at him right there. I know. I mean, he looks like the school season's almost over. Well, we graduated last week, so it is polo time now. No more ties and suits, so I can go a little more casual while kids are not in school. So. Like it. Like it. Like it. Love it, Steve. Um, hey, Steve, let's hold this guy. I know he's hard to double team, but let's hold him to that quasi-promise of Great. of getting together at that next vacation, right, Andy? Yeah, I'll treat you to a burrito. 